All right, so this week we have a great guest. Lev Galinkin is a contributor to The Nation magazine and the author of A Backpack, A Bear, and Eight Crates of Vodka, a memoir of growing up in late Soviet era Ukraine and coming to the US as a refugee. Lev has done a lot of fantastic journalism on Ukraine, not just during this current crisis, but over the the last eight years and really offering a um, debunking of so many of the prevailing narratives that we get in corporate media when it comes to Ukraine and the whole conflict there. So we're very excited to speak to Lev Golinka. So thank you so much for joining us. Welcome, very excited to have you on. You've been saying something that is not that complex, but it seems like a lot of people are incapable of of having these two ideas in their head at the same time, which is that uh, you have condemned the invasion, Putin's invasion of Ukraine, and you also acknowledge that there are neo-Nazi elements in um, the Azov Battalion, which is part of the Ukrainian military. Uh, are you surprised by how incapable people are of having those two ideas in their brains at the same time? Yeah, I'm I'm stunned by it, especially because we're we're at a point where everybody at the same time we're talking about the the existential danger that white supremacy poses to the world. Okay, we're focusing so much on that while simultaneously we are actively going out of our way to whitewash and provide cover for a neo-Nazi battalion. I mean, it's 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 like a it's like a town that says, you know, like fi- fighting fires is so important. It is so so important. Well, there's the middle of the town is on fire and everybody's ignoring it. It's just it's it's insanity. And how has your experience uh, as growing up in Ukraine? How did that inform your view of as of and of of this kind of white supremacy in general? How it's being whitewashed? Well, I mean, it's Ukraine does have an anti-Semitic past. I certainly spent my childhood. Uh, getting, uh, you know, getting introduced to it in Kharkiv, which is actually where the city where Azov was formed out of. But the issue, I think, is not of its past or the or the fact that it's there. I mean, Ukraine is not an anti-Semitic country. I mean, that's if they were an anti-Semitic country, they wouldn't have elected Zelensky. They elected overwhelmingly, they elected a Jewish president. The problem is not that Ukraine is anti-Semitic. The problem is that it has this element that is anti-Semitic in its nation that's far right, okay? And it's it's not, uh, you know, and Russia is trying to paint Ukraine as just a bunch of neo-Nazis, which they're not. It, 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 the problem isn't Ukraine. The problem is the Azov Battalion. You know, th- there's a couple of other units that also have a far right past, but Azov has emerged to be the most successful one by far. So how did Azov come to be so influential? I talk about how they began and who is behind them, who's funding them. They began in uh, end of 2013-2014, the Maidan uprising needed street muscle. They needed people, people came out, they needed people to fight back against uh, the police. And it wasn't gonna be college students fighting back, they needed actual people who are ready to fight. And so these neo-Nazi gangs uh, proved to be invaluable. They formed, they provided, they said they provided security to the Maidan, um, they became influential there. Then after, uh, after the Maidan uprising and the war began with the separatists, Ukrainian army was decimated. I think they had like 6,000 people. I'm not uh, about, about, it was just two decades of corruption, just utterly decimated the army. Okay, there was nothing. I mean, there were warehouses and bases that were supposed to be full of equipment that were just empty. So these people, the neo-Nazi groups then, formed these battalions. And they were, I mean, they did, uh, they did what radicals always do. They were willing to fight. They were willing to kill. They were willing to die. And they were organized already due to, the, due to their past. Uh, so Azov became the most influential one of us. They're ext- uh, of them, they're extremely, they're extremely organized. Um, they are very good with PR. Their leaders are Um, Their leaders are excellent at managing, and they also are descended from uh, these, partly from the Svoboda party, which is a uh, well-organized neo-Nazi party in Ukraine. So they've had this past. It used to be the Social National Party of Ukraine. Um, Then it had a 
ultra uh, uh, violent wing. That wing became the Patriot of Ukraine, neo-Nazi gang, and the Patriot of Ukraine is what formed the core of Azov. And just to show, I mean, how ready they were, they almost immediately started uh, recruiting neo-Nazis from around the world. So they, they uh, even as they were fighting, they were already thinking of turning themselves into a transnational core of white supremacy. The uh, killer in Christchurch who massacred all those worshipers at those two mosques, he claimed uh, to have been inspired somewhat by Azov, or he mentioned Ukraine in some way. And then the killer in Buffalo, he then also claimed to be inspired by the killer in in Christchurch. So, I mean, can we draw a link, do you think, between Azov and, and white supremacists, uh, violent white supremacists globally? Yes and no. The New Zealand, the New Zealand killer did not mention Azov. He mentioned Ukraine, but he mentioned it in the context of several other countries. Okay. So there's nothing specific linking him to Azov. Uh, they both use the sun and rad, the black sun symbol, but that, that which is a very common neo-Nazi symbol. But again, that's like saying, you know, we have no problem admitting that that's what it is with the New Zealand killer and the Buffalo killer. But when Azov freely uses it, we're like, oh, they're not neo-Nazis anymore. You know what I mean? It's 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 maybe they're just using it in a different way. Maybe they're really, uh, you know, worshiping the sun because it is an ancient sun symbol. But so the short answer is a direct link to Azov, no. But that's not the bigger issue. The bigger issue is white supremacy has has undergone a transformation over the past uh, 30 years or so, they no longer see themselves as uh, nations fighting. Before it was, I mean, even if you consider the Nazis, the Nazis did not think that other fascists in Hungary and, and Ukraine, they didn't think that they were uh, true Aryans. They just used them as lackeys. Then, the, you know, the Nazis were concerned about themselves, about the true Aryans. They did not think of anybody else. So it was, you know, Deutschland über alles, not, not white race über alles, but Deutschland über alles. Now, it's fundamentally different. The white supremacists all over the world see themselves as part of the white race and their fight for survival against extinction, which they actually, that is not, when they talk about white genocide, that's not just a PR trick. That's an actual, they truly believe they're going to be exterminated. The founder of Azov, Andriy Belatsky, he, he believed that very much. And he even said the mission of his group uh, of his uh, neo-Nazi gang is to to turn to lead to lead the white races of the world in a final crusade against the Semite-led, the Jew-led Untermenschen. Okay, so in a much larger uh, scope, of course, Azov is tied. To, I mean, there are no so there are no lone wolves. Like I say, there, it's it's a global wolf pack. All these people feel they're part of a of a larger movement uh, of a global struggle for the white race, and Ukraine has become a hotspot. Uh, one could say the hotspot for this struggle. Um, now, it's also very important to point out that the Russian and the Russian separatist side also has a strong neo-Nazi ties, and they do have neo-Nazis coming from around the world. For example, I think in 2017, I believe it was around there, a group of Swedish neo-Nazis uh, that trained with the Russian-backed separatists bombed a refugee shelter in Sweden. Mm -hmm. So what you wind up having is neo-Nazis split based on how they view Russia. Mm -hmm. Some like, for example, Richard Spencer, view Russia as a bastion, it's the last bastion of the white race, despite the fact that Russia has 11 million Muslims, okay? Uh, others, they view Russia as not even white, they view it as an Asiatic horde, and they see that countries of Central Europe being trapped between the liberal LGBTQ uh, democracies of the West and the Asiatic hordes of Russia. So but mo mostly, though, that I found it just where I mean, these people are, aside from the fact that they hate each other, they're pretty much indistinguishable. It's kind of like the Bloods and the Crips, like, it, you know, where somebody winds up, it, it, they're both very similar. They just happen to be deathly rivals. So where somebody winds up on one side of the, of the divider or the other is generally just based on whether just their networks so many times. 
uh, often like for, and also like, you know, if somebody's in Serbia, Serbia is historically aligned with Russia. So a Serbian neo-Nazi is much more likely to go to Russia. Now a Croatian neo-Nazi is much more likely to join Ukraine. So what you have is you have within the Russian-Ukraine war, you have a mini Balkan civil war happening. It's the same thing, I mean, that's going far off field, but it's the same thing with Chechnya. You have the pro-Russian Chechens and they formed the groups uh, and battalions for the separatists. And then you have the anti-Russian Chechens who hate the pro-Russian Chechens having a mini little civil war within the larger war. One talking point you will hear though from people who minimize the presence of Azov inside the Ukrainian armed forces is that politically far right groups don't get very many votes inside Ukraine and that Ukraine elected a Jewish president. So how can there be a problem with neo-Nazis in a situation where you have a Jewish president and far right political parties getting such a small share of the votes? How do you respond to that? Yeah, very easily. Those are the two separate points and it's very easy to refute both of them. For Ukraine, despite what Russia is trying to say, is not an anti-Semitic country. In fact, the fact that they voted for Zelensky, who's Jewish, and who is openly Jewish, is incredible. It's a, it, they also had a Jewish prime minister. It's, it's, it's a wonderful, it's a great thing. It's, it's just, it's such a turnaround from, from the dark past that Ukraine had. And I think that's fantastic. Okay, and Ukraine also has a thriving Muslim population as well. So you have, it's, it's, it's a very diverse society. Um, that said, America elected Barack Obama and saying that because Ukraine elected a Jewish president, if they cannot have a neo-Nazi element, that's like saying that America elected Barack Obama, which ended racism. So then why are we talking about Buffalo shootings? Why are we talking about Charlottesville? Why are we talking about any of that? Barack Obama ended racism. How can we have a, a, a black president in racism? So that's, that, I mean, that's just nonsensical. Uh, the, the second argument is that uh, the far right do not do well in the polls. That's correct. They do not do well in the polls, but they're not interested in the polls. They, they have, uh, their action is through violence. They have carte blanche to, to do, to recruit neo-Nazis around the world. The, uh, you, I mean, you could say, uh, I mean, again, if you're looking at politics, you could say that, you know, the Buffalo, you know, the, the alleged shooter in Buffalo and the shooter in El Paso and the Pittsburgh synagogue uh, shooter, none of them had a, stood a chance of being elected mayor uh, of any American town. So just because they didn't do well in the polls doesn't make them safe. Uh, it's like like any any justification that the uh, that the American think tank and media establishment use uh, to whitewash us off will crumble at the merest, merest examination of it, just like these. And what are some of the worst examples of this whitewashing? I know it's probably hard to whittle them down because there's so many, but. Uh, th I mean, they are, my God, this war has been uh, mana from heaven for them, okay? I mean, we have, the BBC started saying, the BBC was one of the first first groups to actually cover uh, Azov in the beginning. And they were they, laudably, they actually covered it and they not only covered it, but they covered how they're attracting neo-Nazis from around the world. It was, it was one of the first, I, I still remember seeing it was amazing. Now the BBC is saying that Azov is not neo-Nazi and it's actually Russian lies. So it's, uh, it's, I mean, at this point, it's like the onion would think that it's a little too much on the nose. It's, it's, the BBC is saying that the BBC is lying. Okay, uh, USA Today had a story. Uh, it was a, it had a pretty blunt headline. It said something like, you know, Ukrainian nationalist uh, battalion contains Nazis. Okay, and it has a guy who went the correspondent went and talked to them, saw swastikas, talked to people who said things like, "I am a Nazi." Okay, um, and now the USA Today USA Today is doing a fact check about. This, does does our battalion have Nazi roots and things like that? It's it's you know I'm, I'm just uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but you know and the the Ukrainian battalion may have some neo Nazi past, but really what is it now? Uh, as if somehow this battalion that magically um, that somehow became uh, non neo Nazi, and I mean just. I was just talking right before this, I was just talking with somebody who's an editor at a major publication, a very smart person, you know, and they asked, you know, are you sure they're still neo-Nazi? And I'm like, okay, David Duke has left the Ku Klux Klan, 
a long, long time ago. David Duke, and I'm not joking, says that he is a human rights activist. That is how he portrayed himself in an interview about, I don't know, two years ago. Richard Spencer also said he is, he's, he's not, he's not neo-Nazi, he's not far right, okay? Could you imagine a newspaper actually giving this credence? Could you imagine like an editor being like, but is David Duke really still racist? You know, have that changed at all? It's, and here we have a battalion with, by the way, it's not just the, the, the problem with Zorov is not just the neo-Nazi nature. It's the fact that it also has a giant track record of war crimes, of torture, of execution, of uh, just everything you can imagine, okay? And that's not, that's not my documentation. That's documented by Amnesty International and the United Nations in multiple, multiple, multiple reports. And they also have a subpar little uh, brown shirt unit, a street patrol unit that uh, distinguished itself upon being formed. They were formed in 2018 and immediately distinguished themselves by going after Ukraine's Roma and carrying out pogroms of them. So, and that's an important thing to remember that it's, when we're talking about whitewashing this unit, this isn't just a bunch of drunkards sitting around. This isn't the neo-Nazis at Charlottesville with polo shirts. This isn't people like Richard Spencer, you know, and, and those can be deadly considering those that somebody killed at Charlottesville. But compared to this, I mean, this is a group that has a track record of war crimes. This is a group that has destroyed people in Donbass. This is not heroes, and this is this is people who have an impact. Okay, this is this is people who have blood on their hands, and and we're just whitewashing them. And you can just look across newspapers. You can just look, and it's just all of a sudden it's like this battalion. You know, uh, just now they said, oh, uh, DW, uh, one of the major outlets in Europe. I'm looking at it here. It says, you know, Azov Azov regiment is accused of having neo-Nazi past. I mean, at this point, they're not even saying that they changed. They're not even saying they were in the neo-Nazis and they stopped. They're saying, we don't even know if they have a neo-Nazi past. Perhaps they were a knitting club that took up arms. We don't know. Okay, so this is just, and this is all happening at the same time as all of these media outlets are squealing about how white supremacy is an existential threat. And yet they're actively going out of their way to give cover to this organization that trains and recruits white supremacists all over the world. And the other example that I was gonna say, and this is a very, very important example, Facebook, I just got confirmation from Facebook that they have retained their policy on Azov. Here's what ended up happening. Facebook banned Azov's page, okay, as extremists. Then in February, they lifted the, they not only had Azov banned, but they had posts praising Azov band. In other words, you cannot post uh, the Azov Battalion is amazing, I love the Azov Battalion. That would get blocked because Facebook recognized them as a neo-Nazi group, as an extremist group. In February, they lifted that part of the band. They said that you can now praise them only in the, uh, provided it's in the context of defending Ukraine. <laughs> I spoke with Facebook yesterday and, uh, and I, and I said, you know, have, have they lifted the band? And they said, no, nothing has changed after Buffalo. So just take your, just wrap your mind around this, okay? This is, Facebook has had an entire campaign based around how it promotes white supremacy, okay? And here, here they are, not only, ignore, this, isn't, this is not them ignoring something. This is not them turning a blind eye. This is them taking action. This is them proactively. This is them saying, we are know who these people are and we're going to allow you to praise them anyway. Okay, this is them proudly taking action on this. Okay, and think about this. We're not talking about there's a ban on Ukraine. You can, you can praise Ukraine. And I think Ukrainian defenders are being extremely brave. And I mean, I think people, I'm from Kharkiv, from Eastern Ukraine, that's getting destroyed right now. And I mean, I think, I, I think the people that are going through hell, I think, I, I think the world should be united about them. Why is it necessary to praise this unit? Couldn't, couldn't they just praise Ukrainian armed forces or any other non-neo-Nazi units? Why did Facebook have to proactively say that we're allowed to praise them? What is, uh, why couldn't we just praise Ukraine? 
Okay, this is how this is how sickening this is. This is from the same group that says, "Oh, we worry about neonatism." This is from the same people that say that every time Tucker Carlson sneezes, it's the second coming of Hitler. Okay, and yet they will go out of their way to actually say, "You know what? You can praise these neo-Nazis. We know they're neo-Nazis. We're fully aware of that." But provided you say they're being great in defending Ukraine, okay? If this was the nineteen, if this was the nineteen eighties. They would be doing this with Osama bin Laden and the founding members of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. We know they're a little extreme, but you can praise them so long as, you know, it's in the context of fighting for Afghanistan. Okay? This is what we do. We would be having hashtag bin Laden, okay, on Twitter. We would be having Western media weeping with joy at, at the resilience and the bravery of uh, the founding members of Taliban and Al-Qaeda. I wanted to ask you also about the uh, step on Bandera, sure. uh, because as we've covered on the show, uh, you know, there was that mayor, Ukrainian mayor who had his photo in the background, which no one uh, thought to, to ask him to remove the photo or anything, the portrait. Why would they? Yeah, exactly. So I, I've heard people say, oh, he wasn't a Nazi because he was in a Nazi concentration camp. What's your response to that? He was a Nazi collaborator and a fascist. That's who he was. Yes, at some point, at one point, the Nazis had enough of them because the Nazis didn't even trust them, and uh, they imprisoned him in uh, in a concentration camp. Then they promptly let him out, and uh, so that's that. I mean, the fact. Listen, at, there were many times when the Nazis would turn on their lackeys. There were times when they would turn on them and execute them. Okay, because uh, Stepan Bandera was interested in turning Ukraine into a fascist state. Well, the Nazis uh, couldn't care less about that, and they just wanted to turn Ukraine into a farm, into a giant farmhouse for Germany. I'll put it this way: saying that Stepan Bandera was not a Nazi collaborator, you might as well say that Ad that Eichmann didn't participate in the Holocaust. Okay, Stepan Bandera was a fascist through and through. His vision of Ukraine was a Ukraine freed of Russians, Jews, and Poles. And him and his men have done everything in their power to liquidate these people. Okay? His organization was thoroughly anti-Semitic. It was a, one of the cornerstones of their entire existence. Okay? Um, he did not ally himself with Germany out of convenience, even... And even if he did, that would not have been, it's like, well, okay, so give me the reason, you know, you might have been part, you might have been fought for Hitler, but you know, you had, you, your heart wasn't in it, okay? Uh, but that, that wasn't even the case. He, the only difference between them and the Nazis was that the Nazis thought that there was subpar garbage and Stepan Bandera thought that he, that Ukraine was uh, God's gift to the world and the, uh, the, the, the uh, Ubermensch, okay? That's the only difference. It's, he was a Nazi collaborator. Every Holocaust organization, the US Holocaust Museum, Yad Vashem, the Israeli Holocaust Museum, Holocaust scholars, everybody will say that. Saying he's not, and again, this, this has repercussions. His men murdered, his men massacred tens of thousands of Jews and 70,000 to 100,000 Poles in the most vicious way possible. I mean, I'm talking about the ways that would make Hannibal Lecter think it's a bit excessive. It was just, it's, it's brutal what they did to Poland, okay? They, they didn't want to use bullets, so they just hand by hand exterminated the villages, okay? And, and the fact that, they're, that Ukraine is whitewashing them is, is disgusting. And Zelensky has not been helpful on this. Uh, before, when he was right about, um, right around the time of the presidential election, he said, well, you know, some in Ukraine worship Stepan, but, you know, they idolize Stepan Bandera, and that's cool. I mean, can you imagine, like, Obama being like, you know, some in America idolize the Confederacy, and that's cool. Different strokes for different folks. Okay? This is, this is, what, this is what Zelensky, who says he, he lost people in the Holocaust, and that's what he said. It's insane that, the, and this is happening, and this is happening across Ukraine, he's become uh, idolized. And it's, it's especially painful to people from Eastern Ukraine who have fought, who have, uh, the vast majority of Ukraine fought against the Nazis, okay? And here you have these people who worship the, the, these guys and they're putting up their statues in places where, I mean, we're talking about like 
420,000 Americans died in World War II total, okay? Something like 270,000 Ukrainians died in the battle for Kharkiv, in one battle for my city, one battle. There were four battles of Kharkiv, okay? So this is, the land was, the Nazis were defeated in blood. And now you have this small group, small group that does not speak for all Ukrainians, imposing their, their heroes on the, rest, on the rest of the land. I mean, it's, 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 you know, we have problem with Confederate statues now, but this is taking it to a different degree. This is, this would be starting to put Robert E. Lee statues all over America, okay? And saying all of America loves it. And, and suddenly Western media would be like, well, Robert Lee wasn't that bad. So it's, it's I mean, Stepan Bandera was a Nazi collaborator. Stepan Bandera and his men were Holocaust perpetrators. The fact that the Nazis at, at one point got tired of him and, and and jailed him doesn't really say much. It just says that the Nazis were not, the Nazis really didn't care for them at all, which right. is just the Nazis used them to do their dirty work, like murder infants. Uh, and do concentration camp guards. The Nazis were smart. They just used them as lackeys. That was right. it. And it's consistent with their views, the Nazi views, right? Like they didn't consider Ukrainians their their equals. Oh, no. They, so. They're going to starve them. I mean, and they did starve so many Ukrainians. And the other thing, uh, one, you reminded me of something. One thing that often gets lost is uh, one of the biggest targets of Bandera and his men were just ethnic Ukrainians too. Yeah because they killed anybody who didn't agree with them. So uh, in addition to murdering Jews, Poles, they, they, they massacred any Ukrainian who, who they, thought was, they thought was against them. And then the president, uh, Viktor Yushchenko, declared Bandera a hero. Yes. Did that surprise you? No. No, okay. Not at all. I mean, to them, he's a hero. And, and it's... it's uh, like I said, he's not a tragic figure. They say he's a freedom fighter, and he was a freedom fighter. It's true. But once again, everybody's a freedom fighter. Everybody fights for something. There's, a, there, there's no real, like, actual jokers that much in history and in the world. Everybody's fighting for a cause. His cause just happened to be a Ukraine that was ethnically cleansed of anybody who was not ethnic Ukrainian and who did not believe in the fascism of Bandera. When it comes to Zelensky, he was elected in 2019 on a mandate of peace. Is it fair to say that he was intimidated by followers of Bandera and other far right groups into not making peace with Russia? Because he has faced threats of both being overthrown and even of death from some far right leaders. Well, it's very hard for me and he has shown a lot of bravery and it's very hard for me to say what he's thinking. So I'll just give an example, a small example of what happened. Shortly after being elected, um, a Ukrainian station decided to do something called the Telemost, okay? It's uh, a show in which they would have people from Russia and people from Ukraine talking to each other on TV, just everyday people talking about their issues. It's a, uh, it's a very symbolic thing for people who, for the people who know the history, because in the 1980s, um, they did this between, Phil Donahue did this, with uh, Posner, uh, Vladimir Posner in the Soviet Union. And it was seen as a big step towards peace, towards reducing tensions, when they had people in America, people in Moscow talk about their issues. And I remember it was, it was I was a kid, but it was just a huge, huge deal. Everybody saw this. So this television station was, was gonna do this. Biletsky, Andrei Biletsky, the new Nazi who was, in uh, who was in charge of Azov and who formed Azov, he put out a short video telling Zelensky that if this program wasn't canceled, they were gonna the next conversation was gonna take place in Zelensky's office. Okay. Within like an hour of that video, it was announced that the program was canceled. Okay. Now, this is like, I mean, what like what kind of a place do you have where somebody can just openly threaten the president? and the president and, and, and the demands are immediately met. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know how much Zelensky has tried to push back against them because I have a feeling if he did, we would know about it. I really have, no, I, I don't want to speak for him. Like I said, I just, uh, I'm telling you his actions and his words. And I don't 
know what would happen if you tried to get them to cross the street and they didn't want to cross the street. I don't know. Because, but it's certainly, they, so far, uh, the far right has just had, they've acted with impunity when it comes to the, uh, one of it, uh, on the rare occasions, one of them is charged with murder, for example. They would just storm the courtroom and they would make sure that, that, that nothing happened. And none of that was pushed back on. Which is again like, why would they need to have election power? They have the power to override things with violence. They don't need election. 